Welcome to Industry Insights first episode of 2023. Today I'll be talking to Dr. Darren Detweiler. Hi everyone and welcome to this year's first edition of Industry Insights. And let me start by wishing all of you a happy new year and I'm hoping it's uh, going to be a great one for each and every one of you. And uh, for sure, I'm hoping you had a wonderful holiday season. You were able to enjoy the time with your family and friends. And most important of all, of course, I'm really hoping you stayed safe and healthy and didn't have any complications with food or any challenges or get sick because you ate something specifically. Um, so that's... Um, the most important thing to all of us, right? And uh, this is exactly what leads me to my topic today. And again, I'm able and happy to welcome Darren Detweiler. Um, and we're focusing today on the 30th anniversary of the check in the box um, accident. And I'm happy to, to hear what Darren can share with us about that. Hello, Darren. Hello, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Of course. Anytime. Well, you know, many people in uh, outside the United States might not uh, instantly know about the the 1993 Jack in the Box E. coli outbreak. Essentially, it was a fast food restaurant, predominantly on the West Coast of the United States, California, Oregon, and Washington State. And um, you know, this was a time where where we didn't really associate E. coli with 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 food that we consumed, and and it was not a household name like it is today to some extent. Um, there was a contaminated lot of ground beef that was shipped from, um, from from Southern California all the way up to just right under the Canadian border to restaurants. And um, uh, unfortunately, the restaurant uh, chain, they were not cooking the hamburgers to a safe enough temperature to provide a kill step for this. Uh, some 750 people were uh, sickened some 140 to 150 uh, uh, sick consumers uh, were, were hospitalized and uh, the greatest kind of observation was how many of these were children and uh, ultimately four children died um, due to renal failure due to uh, complications from E. coli and, and hemolytic uremic syndrome um, and uh, I got involved in this because one of those four children that died was my son. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, some specifics around my son, he was 16 months old. He never ate the product. Mm -hmm. He got sick from a person-to-person -person contamination from another child in his daycare class. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, um, uh, sorry, I had to close the door. Um, uh, we, we learned a lot about food safety uh, as a result of this. I mean, here was a situation where it exploded on the, the, the media uh, scene. It was covered. My son's funeral was covered uh, live on television. Uh, the president of the United States, Bill Clinton, who had just recently been inaugurated, um, he not only, I talked with him on a televised uh, town hall meeting, uh, before my son's death, but after my son's death, I talk with him one-on-one -on -one in terms of what do we do? You know, what do we, yeah. father to father, what do we do as a result of this? And I remember telling him that, that um, you know, we, we need to make sure something positive comes out of this and that while I'll be forever uh, in a position where I'm answering that I lost my son, I don't want in some sense that my son to say that he lost his father. Um, so, you know, we, we, we looked at this um, in 1993. I mean, I looked at it thinking that, you know, changes in policy or technology was going to, you know, pre ultimately prevent this from happening. But what we've learned is that over the last 30 years, you know, it's been a rather, you know, a seemingly endless cycle of, of failure and reform where consumers are essentially the canary in the coal mine. You know, we don't have recalls and outbreaks called until after consumers have been harmed. And in the United States, the Centers for Disease Control, their numbers, their estimates of how many people are become sick, become hospitalized and die every year, they've not changed in three decades. 
30 yeah. years are the same numbers. And we've seen some other changes. I mean, there's been significant changes with USDA policy, specifically around meat and poultry. And we've seen that there are still outbreaks and recalls tied to meat and poultry, but those numbers have decreased significantly. However, they've been replaced by numbers of, of outbreaks and recalls and, and people that become sick and hospitalized and die due to foods that are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Basically, over 80% of all foods, we're talking about produce, commercially packaged goods, ready-to-eat foods. Yeah. Um, um, so many foods in the United States that now, you know, when we look at the idea of food journey, the, the, the last mile of food's journey becomes very complicated. We have much more in terms of uh, ready to eat foods, commercially packaged goods. We have food trucks, we have food delivery, we have, mm -hmm. uh, you can buy food on apps and, and have it delivered to your house. You can even have people uh, do your grocery shopping for you. The, the pandemic has definitely showed this change in consumer behavior. Um, you know, it's not just the, simply the, the traditional brick and mortar uh, restaurant or grocery store anymore. Um, we also know a couple of things uh, coming out of, of, of 1993. One is that we say foodborne illness, but getting sick from eating the food is only one part of it. There are people like my son who get sick from person to person contact. Mm -hmm. We know that there are many people that get sick from waterborne exposure. Uh, there's even animal exposure where people are at petting zoos or animal farms or, yeah, yeah. or things like that. And that's how they get sick. And in the case of norovirus, there's airborne. Um, we also need to make sure that we're clear that everyone can become sick. Everyone can become sick mm -hmm. from these pathogens, but it's the most vulnerable populations, the very elderly, the very young, those who are pregnant and those with compromised immune systems. These are the ones who are most likely to end up being diagnosed, being hospitalized, uh, and not only uh, end up dying. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also the category that we don't often talk about, which is those individuals who technically they're discharged from the hospital and they, they're listed as having recovered, but they live with lifelong medical complications yeah. as a result of this. Their life, their quality of life, never the same as it was before they got sick. Um, we, can't, we can't forget those people as well. So... Um, we, we obviously in the United States, there's been change with the Food and Drug Administration. We have the, the, mm -hmm. the uh, FDA's Food Safety Modernization Act that was signed into law by President Barack Obama in 2011. And the implementation started in 2016, and we're still not fully implementing all of the various rules uh, with, with this Food Safety uh, Modernization Act. Today, there's been some delays, there's been some new rules more focus on technology and traceability, um, as we see with this uh, new era of smarter food safety. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the time we're still rolling out these new rules for the Food Safety Modernization Act. Again, the, the world of, of food's journey just continues to evolve and consumer behavior evolves. And we continue to see, um, you know, new challenges, new outbreaks and recalls and, and concerns. But I, I want to say that, that um, you know, as much as it's easy for me to just focus on failures, there's been so many successes. Mm -hmm. There's been mm -hmm. yeah. so many successes. And I am so motivated and inspired by people I work with in industry and in, in regulatory circles uh, who day in and day out focus so much attention and they – they go beyond industry, you know, they, they go beyond their brand, if you will. They're not just helping out their own company, they're helping out even their competitors in terms of, of making sure that food is as safe as it can be. Yeah. And consumers, consumer awareness of food safety has skyrocketed over, over the last three decades. And um, even social media, how consumers engage and talk about food safety over the last three decades. I mean, well, it didn't exist three day, you know, 30 years ago, but today right, right. we see evidence of the fact that there is um, a consumer involvement and awareness in this idea of a culture of food safety. Mm -hmm. So again, um, it, it's been a, a, a 
30 years of, of change and continued failure in the face of success and inspiration and, and positive changes. Yeah, wow, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And like you said, social media, it, it's so much easier these days to reach out to consumers. I mean, 30 years ago, um, I don't really think mobile phones were even on the market, at least not to that extent as they are today. Right. Um, if they so now, if they were they were big and they only made phone calls <laughs> right right and uh, but today it's you, you can go online wherever you are you can get your information you can either have um according apps or, or you, you know you know your, your sites where you want to go to get your information that are specifically tailored to your behavior to your eating habits and stuff so that is a huge step forward but i also agree with all the the new and a lot of, of, of those are based on COVID, uh, the new uh, developments that are that have happened and are still happening with meal kits being delivered and, and stuff like that. And it's just so many more challenges out there. But then again, we have better tools to, to work with them and, and inform companies, consumers. Um, yeah, it, it has been, a lot has happened, not enough, I agree, it, there's still so much room for improvement, and there needs to be more improvement happening, more, even more awareness, I would say, I mean, of course, it has increased, I completely agree with you, but still, I mean, you know, like, when I watch a cooking show on TV, hardly ever do they wash the food that they're processing and that is something where people watch and say oh okay so that's how it goes and then they don't wash or how about wash how about washing their hands yeah yeah sure let's start at the basic <laughs> yeah and but and i think that is also needs to be part of the education in, in people mind in people's minds to to really uh realize okay now we are people follow what we're doing so they watch us closely and if we don't wash our hands if we don't wash produce or meat or fish uh, in the right way or if they don't handle it the right way um there are consequences and and well we and i'm glad you brought that up because those consequences are what are often overlooked you know we need to make sure um there's a couple things you need to look at um you know how it is um you can't you can't you know look at the idea of getting your children to wear their seatbelts in the car or, or um, you know, if they're teenagers, don't drink and drive or don't text and drive, yeah. right? Unless there's a, there's an awareness of consequences, right? The mm -hmm. idea of likelihood and severity. What's the likelihood of something happening? And what's the severity of something happening? Mm -hmm. So when you look at that, you look at the idea of the true burden of disease. And this is something that's far beyond statistics and bar graphs and that kind of a thing. You know, when I'm talking with uh, legislators, when I'm talking with regulators, when I'm talking with industry, when I'm talking to students, um, you know, I talk about the true burden of disease. I share the stories from 30 years ago. Uh, well, I share the stories of other families as well. But mm -hmm. when I share the stories of, of my, uh, of what happened with my son, you know, I, I remind them about the idea that he was 16 months old, that, um, you know, th there are a few memories in my mind that are I'll never forget. I'll never forget holding him yeah. while sitting on a hospital bed, and he looked at the the IV bottle hanging from a pole, yeah. and he called for it because it was a clear vessel with marks and liquid in it. It looked like his bottle. Mm -hmm. He called for it. He said, you know, he would say he was 16 months old. He said, Baba, Baba, yeah. and that was him asking for his bottle. He wanted comfort. He wanted normality. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing him being put on a uh, onto a helicopter, and his little tuft of blonde hair sticking out from the blankets under the straps. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing him coming out of, of surgery where he had the majority of his, his uh, intestines removed and he was in a coma and his body, I mean, here's a 16 month old boy. It was in a room where he was just so dwarfed by mm -hmm. wires and tubes and equipment and, and, you know, uh, uh, monitors and, and, and devices and then the last time I saw him outside the hospital was when he was being carried in the world's smallest coffin. And, um, you know, this is, um, you know, in your own mind, you can imagine that th these are not the final images that last a lifetime. You know, in this case, for 30 years, 
uh, of, of a, a father, a parent would ha want to have of their 16 month old son mm, um, or daughter. And, you know, when I tell this story, when I tell other people's stories, I talk about this and there are a couple of things I focus on. One is that, you know, this is what we're talking about in terms of consumer safety, food safety. It's not about trying to achieve some numbers. It's mm -hmm. not about, um, you know, it, it's not about optics and the media. Mm -hmm. It's truly making sure that you, you, you can't call it food unless it's safe food. You know, yeah. No one wants to fly on a plane that's not safe or drive a car that's not safe. You know, you don't want to take a flight unless it's ultimately a safe flight. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the idea of the food that we place, you know, in front of our family. No one right. wants, no parent wants to live with a chair forever empty at their family table mm -hmm. because of something that could have been prevented. Mm -hmm. I talk about the idea of corporate companies, how their responsibility, how, how this is not an add-on. This is not a philanthropic. This is a baseline requirement. But I also talk about um, the idea that there are companies that had all the information and they had all the tools, but they did not decide to take action. They did not decide, let's do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the missing element is, is courage. You know, it takes courage to look beyond cost benefit analysis or return on investment. It takes courage to stand up and say, this is a problem. We need to fix this. We need to stop production. We need to, we need to slow things down. We need to look at this. Uh, and that's that's critical. Um, and there's there's two things that I I want to come back to at some point, but but uh, I want to give the floor back to you. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I would just wanted to add knowledge to your. It takes courage, but also knowledge. If people, I mean, of course, if they see something is going wrong, um, they should be able uh, should be um, empowered to hit the button. But also in order to be able to do that, they need to know what, what is wrong per definition. And right. they need to know what, what tools do we have in our company, in our processing company or in, in our retail store? Are there any options? Are there any tools that I can use in order to prevent things from happening? And um, coming back to the recalls, um, I can all, you know, I have to repeat myself, but I, I met this one woman and she said, Oh, so you're in the recall space. So you're the woman I would never want to meet. And I was, no, I am the woman you desperately, desperately need to meet in order to be able to do a recall right, make it fast and efficient and you know, do everything to get products off the shelves as fast as possible. And, and she looked at me and she was, oh, yeah, if you look at it from that point of view, and I mean, there is no other point of view because Ultimately, what it is we want to do is protect consumers, protect our families, our kids, friends, everyone. And um, also, I would say, I mean, food safety is no competition uh, right. because we're all consumers. And so, I mean, there is no use in, in having a competition on, on these things because they are just so important to all of us. And it doesn't really matter. Um, who is the first in, in having a new tool or a new invention. And, and if someone has come up with something new, well, then share it with everyone else because we all need to be aware of these things. Well, you know, in the face of new tools and technologies and policies, you know, we can look back to the London Daily Times uh, over 115 years ago, literally over 115 years ago, the London Daily Times was talking about Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle. Mm -hmm. um, and it talked about it as being unfortunate that uh, what he describes is all too real. And to quote the review, it said that uh, it is with um, great misfortune uh, that we understand it all to be true. The things described, the things described by Mr. Sinclair happened yesterday and are happening today and tomorrow and the next day until some Hercules comes to cleanse the filthy stable. And it, again, 110, 115 years later, it's like it's still true. But I mean, we know that there's not a Hercules, right? But I think it's a poetic way of talking about this idea of, of Herculean effort, enormous amount of work, strength, and courage to pull this off. And it sounded like something very antiquated. 
But you know, one of the families that I met over the years, I've met so many families, those who have lost children, uh, those who fortunately their children lived, uh, but are living with lifelong medical complications. And this one family, I met with the mom, uh, her son had E. coli and while on dialysis had a stroke and um, has, has forever lost the use of his left arm. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how he can't play like the other kids in the playground at school. Um, but he also, the, the mom shared that he had drawn a, 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 a crayon drawing of a superhero in flight with a cape. And she shared with me how she asked her son, what was this about? And her son said that he wished that someone in the food company, in his words, someone in the food company, in the food industry, had done something or said something or, or, or you know, ultimately prevented him from not being able to be like the other kids. And that really stuck with me. And I share that image mm -hmm. uh, today, still, years later, I still share this image with, with people in the food industry, whether they be frontline food workers or executives or lawyers uh, or uh, FDA uh, regulators, state, federal government regulators. And I, I, I try to impress upon them the fact that, that your job is so important. Yeah. That in the eyes of a child, of a child who's forever impacted by the failure of food safety, in a world of all the Marvel and DC superhero movies and TV shows, mm -hmm. you're seen as a superhero. You're seen as someone who's literally not wearing a suit or a, a, a smock or a lab coat or a name tag or a hairnet. Mm -hmm. You're seen as someone who's wearing a cape. And that if you can't perceive yourself as having that much of an impact on people's lives, then remember how some people view you and the work that you do as being that Herculean, being that superhero effort in their lives. Yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah, that's wonderful. And I think as painful and heartbreaking um, sharing those stories, especially when they're your own story is, it is so important because it, you know, it, it just... It helps people understand the necessity of um, food safety, uh, food safety culture, as we are already touched a little bit on the side. Um, so these things are so important to all of us. And I'm very grateful and thankful that, that you, Darren, shared your very personal, tragic story with us um, opening up like that. I can imagine it's painful every time you think of it, you talk about it. And, and yet it is so important to, to show people out there, um, yeah, the importance of their, of their profession, of their being, of, of their being aware and um, acting up to what they are supposed to be doing and be given the knowledge, be given the, the awareness and, and uh, the power to, um, to protect consumers worldwide. And well, you know, it's, it's, it's also a way for me to, you know, be there in that moment when I'm speaking in front of, and I speak a lot, um, uh, when, when I'm speaking in front of audiences, it's a way for me to kind of be there for yeah. my son, um, you know, and ultimately, um, you know, I try to make sure that my audiences remember what I look at as the four C's, um, the, the consumer impact of food safety, the responsibility of the company, the mm -hmm. company responsibility, um, how important courage is for the people at the company to always prioritize and invest in food safety at all times. Yeah. And then finally, the idea of how important it is to always wear with pride that cape, that idea that um, you know, if we can't recognize our successes uh, and we only focus on our failures, then we're really doing an injustice to such great work that is being done out there and how important that work is. Yeah, and I think there's no better way to end this interview than with those words of yours, Darren. Thank you so much. I'm hoping a lot of people will listen to this interview and learn and be encouraged, motivated by your words, by what you had to go through, by your experiences, of course, your wife as well. Um, so thank you again for opening up, for sharing your story with us. And um, I know how, um, how busy you are talking to, to people and, and, and sharing that story and encouraging them to um, not give up, to continue working on how to improve food safety and just do everything they can to protect consumers. And uh, that is 
just wonderful and i'm really looking forward to meeting you again in person and um well maybe we'll do a next interview sometime and i'm um, looking forward to that as well but now for now let's um let's end this interview and thank you so much for participating thank you you're welcome this has been today's episode industry insights with my guest dr darren detweiler thanks for your attention and see you again soon bye